We hear the question a lot in social media and letters to the editor these days, especially since the George Zimmerman trial. Where is the outrage over crime committed by black people, against black people, or in poor neighborhoods in general? While there are plenty of people outraged by that crime, my guest today is one of them. And he has made news recently for doing something about it. Pastor Jarvis Wash of the Real Church of Rockledge understands the pain of crime as he tries to encourage residents to cooperate with police and put their personal pain and grudges behind them. Wash knows the pain of losing a loved one, and he knows the world of crime from the inside, as you'll learn today. Also coming up in the program, my freedom ride over the Pineda Causeway, which recently opened to bicycles for the first time. I'll show you what I found when I tried it against readers and co-workers' advice. But first, watch my interview with Pastor Jarvis Wash. You started an initiative on Facebook to try to overcome this culture of no snitching. Explain. Matt, there was um, two shootings, well, five shootings. Two people were injured. Uh, people's homes in, in my community were um, basically just shot all up and it wasn't on the newspapers. Uh, I, I didn't see it in the news on TV. And I felt as just as a citizen, before a pastor or community leader, I felt as a citizen something needed to be said about this issue. And social media is a, is a network where everybody's touching, everybody's on, and I felt the need to say something about it. Um, so, so after waking up 4 o'clock that morning, I waited good until about 6, and I posted basically that death plus prison equals loss. And in so many words that it was our responsibility to say something about it. And since people weren't talking to the police, since anybody wouldn't talk to the police, that they could come and talk to me to break this code. And not just to tell on the guys that were doing it, but the guys that are actually doing the shooting, if they would come talk, and if we could sit down and squash this before somebody gets hurt. This is in Coco. This is in Coco. Correct, okay. Yeah, that's one of the things that I find uh, is such a conundrum. Yeah. On one hand, there seems to be some suspicion in, uh, among uh, black people in mm -hmm. parts of Brevard County that a lot of unsolved crimes and a lot of unsolved murders remain unsolved because the police are disinterested or, or, or not going to act aggressively on uh, crimes involving uh, black victims. But at the same time, there's this culture of not, not telling the police mm -hmm. what, who did what and, 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 and helping to solve those cases if they did want to investigate. How do you square that? Well, I, I think it's a little bit on both sides. I'm, I'm not completely sure. I'm, I'm not a police officer. I'm a pastor and a community leader. But I, I know that there is this code in our community with, uh, without snitching, don't tell, don't say anything. Um, and I believe that's wrong for several reasons. It's wrong for one reason because nobody wants to tell until they want some information, until something happens to their family, something happens to their little brother or family member. And I think... Um, I think accountability has to come in that area. Somebody has to own up and say, this is my community, I'm going to talk. I'm right. going to say something about this. And um, as, as far as the cops, they can only do their job. They can have all the answers, but if no one comes forward, right. then they can't move forward, so. And it, I, I'm assuming that it's out of fear that there's gonna be a retribution against the witnesses? If there, there, there has been because of fear, and then some people wanna take matters into their own hands, truthfully. You know, some, some, some people don't tell and don't, don't say anything because they wanna take matters into their other hands, their, their own hands, and then there are others who, uh, who basically have fear for their life. They're scared. There have been instances where I'm told of those who spoke uh, out or, or said something about something and it got back or they were, they were taken care of. They were. Right. Murdered or killed. Or wow. Threat. Um, you had a Law and Order Community Forum recently. Mm -hmm. Describe that. What are you trying to accomplish? Um, we had a, a Law and Order. First, we had a march. Okay. <laughs> the march happened before the Facebook post. Okay. We had a march for justice for all. It's not a real church event, it's not a Jarvis Wash deal. It's where community leaders and those who are concerned about their community came together. We had the church crowd. We had the club crowd. Right. We had, you know, the. You community. probably also had energy, 
and concern following the Trayvon Martin, Trayvon Martin, Trayvon George Martin Zimmerman deal. case. But it's, but Trayvon Martin, that happened in Sanford. I know it affected the nation, but there are enough issues and unsolved crime and crime going on and murders unresolved in Brevard County. So we use that as an opportunity to then deal with justice for all. And, and, and I kind of put some of that out on Facebook to where we can get over 350 people to march to a park. There's already 200 people there and plus another 150 um, uh, Spanish uh, people already out there. So we're dealing with six, 700 people easy at the park and we can march for that. But less than a week later, there's a shooting and no one has anything to say. People wow. are shooting at, at family members' house and nobody has nothing to say. People are on Facebook threatening each other and no one has anything to say. I, I, I find that very hypocritical, and I, I find that something had to be said, something had to be addressed, and that's what prompted those posts. The Law and Order Forum was a follow-up to after the march, after this agenda at the park where there was prayer and there were kind words and there were people saying, hey, let's speak out, let's stop the crime in our community, for something to happen a week later and none of that to happen. We, we, we organized the Law and Order Forum where we collaborated with uh, the Sheriff Department, uh, Coco PD, Rockledge PD, and, and this was an audience where people could come and talk about their, their issues with the police, good or bad, and there was an open dialogue to where we can talk about being profiled racially, or you can talk about, okay, well, um, why are we being stopped in this area, or how, or, or even teaching our young men and young women, how do you respond when you're pulled over by an officer? How do you respond? What do you do if somebody follows you? What do you do if, if you have a personal uh, issue with an officer or you feel like they have one with you? What are the procedures? And we found from that, we gauged a lot from that, but one thing is key, Matt. We found out that there are those who have um, 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 valid gripes with law enforcement but they're not going the extra mile. They're not filling out reports. They're not doing the paperwork. They're not paying attention to the details. So it's never discovered. Nothing ever happens. So, so now they have the tools they need to address those issues. But the Law and Order Forum was one part of something that's gonna continue to go to really bring um, a great approach to this thing going on in our community. How, what kind of reaction have you had so far? I mean, I know this is a long slog. Yeah trying to change culture, trying yeah. to, to oh, yeah. bridge communication between groups that haven't done it before. Big time. We've had some people to reach out us, reach out to us concerning crime in the community. We had some people that were actually doing the crimes and in fear or part of shootings and things of that, that nature and they basically want to stop, they want to sit down and squash. And it's, it's kind of it's kind of front line here, <laughs> you know, and I know, you know, it's kind of front line here of those who really want to change it, we're kind of in the middle of that. They want, kind to, get of, out. They want to get out, they want to stop. But they want to make sure if they stop, that it's not going to be some retaliation right. from somewhere else. And you know, the thing about this, it, it, gets, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And people who aren't even involved get involved because uh, they were associated with them. My grandma used to always say, birds of a feather mm -hmm. flock together, you know, and sometimes you don't have to be the one that's, that, that started anything, but because you're around, you're guilty by association. How much of the crime that you, that you deal with and the police that you talk to deal with, how much of it is related to drugs? Um, much, but, but I wouldn't say, um, if I had to give it a percentage, I would say 40, 50 percent. Really? So it's not mainly it's, it's not, drug gangs, it's more interpersonal. It's, it's more interpersonal. It's, it's, it's poverty. It's, you know, people. Uh, identifying themselves to uh, to this, like this is the best part of me, like this is this is what I'm good at. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's a lot going on. It's a lot. It's a lot going on. It's not. I don't think it's just drugs. Uh, I don't think it's just drugs or limited to drugs or drug sales or anything like that. You uh, have a, a, an interesting personal story. Mm -hmm. uh, nine years ago, your own son, mm -hmm. Brandon was uh, shot and killed. Mm. What happened? Brandon, um, someone was chasing someone with a gun in the community in the middle of the summer, about six o'clock in the afternoon in Winter Garden, Florida. Uh, 
for those who don't know what Winter Garden is, it's next to Orlando. Okay. And um, that's where my wife's family is is originally from. And uh, their kids outside playing at six o'clock in the evening on a, on a on a sunny summer afternoon. You know, it doesn't get dark till about nine. All of the ruckus, carload of guys is chasing one guy. He runs through the yard. My son comes out. Um, he's at his sister's house. And uh, he says, hey, what are you guys doing? I mean, his kid's jumping on trampolines outside. And how front. old is he at this point? He's 19. Okay. He just turned 19 two weeks before that. Okay. And he says uh, to the guy, one of the guys with a gun, like, hey, man, put the gun up. What you doing? His kid's out here. I mean, the guy is long gone who they're chasing. He's ran right. through the yard, and they're just still ranting and raving. Well, um, the guy puts the gun in his face. Um, my daughter is standing next to him. The guy puts the gun in his face. And, and basically keeps threatening him. My son's like, hey, put the gun down. You know, there's no need for that. If you want to fight, we can fight, but don't, don't, you know, get the gun out of my face. It's a whole lot of people outside. Nobody thinks that this guy is gonna shoot our son. Right. It's, everybody's outside. It's, and, and now they've brought more attention okay. to this yard. Um, some, for some strange reason, a guy walks away, like he's walking to his car to put the gun up and fight or pull away. And some kind of way, he just turns around and just pulls the trigger. Just like that. Just like that. Just like that. And was that crime salt? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. It was in broad daylight. Everybody seen it. The guy um, took off. He was I guess he was on the run for a couple of months. He got sentenced to natural life. Okay. Um, out of that, we started something called the release. Um, Death plus prison equals loss is something that we'd like to say because his mother lost her son for natural life. Right. This guy, we don't hate him. He had did time in prison and jail and things like that. He had been out for two years. He had been on his job for two years. He murdered our son in his work clothes. Somebody was messing with his little brother, and he got home from work. His little brother came to him and said some other guy was messing with his little brother. He ran in the house, got his gun, got in his car, and less than 20 minutes later was murdering our son. This guy was in the same cycle. So, right. so, so we all lost, we lost our son, and this mother lost her son for natural life. He's never getting out. So in your case, uh, how would you characterize the response by police? Attentive, responsive? Yeah, I think it always kind of helps when you, you have relationships with police. Right, okay. <laughs> but, so, uh, but yeah, they were, they were very attentive. They, were, they, they spoke with me and my wife the whole um, time while they were looking for him. They were giving us different tips all the way into the day they had him in the back seat. We got a call and you said, were, hey, we got him. That's good to hear. You had uh, in May a, an interesting event, I think, to cope with that kind of loss, mm -hmm. a, a release of balloons. Mm -hmm. Describe that. Things just don't change. Things just don't go away. Um, time does not heal all wounds. Uh, when you miss people and you love people, you miss them and you love them. And just because the guy was convicted, it did not change the way we missed our son and loved our son. And there are a lot of murders and a lot of people who are missing family members due to violence. And we felt that the release um, was an opportunity. The balloon release was a release of to, to, to tack down those those pains, those feelings, that negative energy, and go ahead and put it on a sticky note, put it on this helium balloon, and, and it was symbolic of letting it go. Not letting go of the persons who you miss, but letting go of all of the pain attached. Like every time I think about my son, Brandon uh, Ramon Childers, you know, I raised him, he was my stepson, I don't need to think about the young man that murdered him. Right. I, he doesn't get that space for free anymore. You get what I'm saying? Right. Like, I, I'm not going to allow the hate and the envy and the pain of that to stop me from remembering my son and the way he was. So my wife started a thing called Healing for the Hurting, where she actually uh, speaks and, and counsels with, with parents, and they do uh, group, group counseling with those who have lost their uh, children or loved ones due to violent crimes. And that was kind of a kickoff of that, Healing for the Hurting. That there is healing for the hurt. Yeah. When I went back and I read our story in Florida Today about that event, <clears throat> I was struck by a quote from you. Mm -hmm. Quote, I did four years in prison. I know what it is to commit crime, and I know what it is to be affected by crime. Mm -hmm. How did you get from, what did you do in, to, to wind up in prison, and how did you wind up becoming a pastor? Woo! 
how much time we got? <laughs> okay. Um, I was born to, I was born in Old California to a mother who was a prostitute, dad that was a pimp. Um, seen a lot of negative things in my life. And, and I, I made a lot of mistakes and did a lot of things I said I would never do. Um, and I can remember meeting my wife, loving my wife. She already had three kids when we, when we met and, and really wanting to give them the best. And uh, God was nowhere in the picture, even though he was, he was completely in the picture. He was nowhere in the picture. And uh, just wanting to slow down and do things right. And uh, I ended up going to jail because I missed court. Um, and I, I had constantly been on, in and out of jail all of my life. I did four years in prison in California, and I can remember being here in Florida. And because I hadn't changed, because I hadn't personally changed, it didn't matter that I was in another state. I hadn't changed. I wasn't in a different state of mind. I was just in a different state, Florida versus California. And I can remember uh, being arrested and being in a 33rd cell. And nobody can tell me that jailhouse religion doesn't work, because it does. And I can remember sitting there in this cell thinking that, look, I'm separated from my family. Um, I had all these goals, all these dreams, all these plans, and something needs to give. And I, I begin to speak to God there and say, God, hey, if you could take some of these desires away from this, the fast money, the women, this kind of lifestyle, then God, I'll, I'll give my life to you. And I'll tell everybody about it. Never thought pastoring or preaching was in a place. I was just no. going to be a good Christian. And um, I was looking at 10 years. I ended up doing 120 days, and I've never been back. Robbery, drugs? Rob, oh, oh, man. Whew. Uh, robbery is what I went to prison for in California. It was basically drugs here, uh, selling of drugs okay. in, in Orlando. And um, that 33rd sale in the county jail in Orlando, I, I did 120 days, and I've never been back. I've never been back. And I started surrounding myself with, with people once I got out. I went to a church around the corner from where, well, actually off the corner and around the corner from where I used to sell drugs at. Is that in right? In Orlando. And then I started, um, I started just going to Sunday school and going to church. Before I knew it, I was teaching Sunday school. Then I was going to seminary. Then I was a youth pastor. Then the next thing I know, we're on, the, we're on OBT, Orange Blossom Trail in Orlando, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning, giving out roses to prostitutes, offering them the love of Jesus Christ. What brought you to Brevard? Brevard, I came to start a church. Okay. The real church. <laughs> what does uh, what does real stand for? Real is, is an acronym. Uh, it doesn't mean our church is real and the rest of them are fake. It's an acronym which stands for reaching, equipping, affecting lives for Christ. So it sounds like your your flock, so to speak, is uh -huh. more than just the people that come to your services, but that you're trying to reach out into the community as well. Yeah, our, 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 we're, we're very clear, Matt, that we are a community church. We're not just another church in the community, but we are a community church. We're, we're for the community, not just for our congregation or our clique or those who are on the role, the church role. We are for the community. And things can't go on in our community that affect our community directly, and we're not be a part of it. I, I mean, I think that's what Jesus called us to do, to, you know, to be in the world, not of the world, but to be in the world, to be engaged to be involved. I want to get your response to something that I see on Facebook just about every day now. Okay. Since the Zimmerman trial, mm. uh, usually from uh, friends who are white and conservative, uh, they'll find some case of uh, black youth who get into trouble, commit some violent crime, same uh, beating or a shooting, and they'll say, where's the outrage out of the, over this? Mm -hmm. Where's the concern and the media attention mm -hmm. to this? Um, is it only when a black, when, when, when a white person kills a black person that, that people pay attention? Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? I respond to that by saying, um, that's, that's not the complete picture. That's not the complete picture. There are people who care. And, and it's, it's so crazy that you would bring that up because there's something that, that's been placed on our heart and something that's, that's being worked on right now called My Community Cares. Okay. Uh, My Community Cares has three functions. It's t we communicate, we celebrate, and then we collaborate. And what My Community Cares is, I believe, in the worst area of Coco, the worst crime, North Fist area, there's no homeowners association, there's no neighborhood watch, Okay, there's no central way 
for, for the people there to find out what's going on in their community. We talked earlier off the air about the shooting that happened in, in front of my house, off of North Fist in Coco. That wasn't in the news, it wasn't on the newspaper. Somebody heard some noises and they don't know what happened. The community at large in that area doesn't know about that. So my community cares will bring communication. Well, we will bring our neighbors back to the neighborhood. Okay, we will meet our neighbors, we'll talk, we'll share, we'll identify the blind spots and the best parts. We will actually canvas the area, survey, meet our neighbors. I'm talking about yard signs, banners, not on my watch, my community cares, we'll communicate, then we'll celebrate, um, actually bring up our value in that area, and then we will collaborate with whatever organization is needed and necessary to help fill in those needs. But, but people will have somewhere to call, to have somewhere to text, to have a point of contact for that. You know, you've mentioned that a few times, social media, texting, do most people in, in your area, everybody's got a phone at this point? Does I think everybody so. Everybody have a phone at this point. I think most people have a phone. I, I okay. don't know who has a home phone anymore. Right. But uh, but they're but they're plugged in. They're wired. They're digital. They're some kind they're of way. posting and some kind of way somewhere. Yeah. I want to get your uh, just reaction, your your take, just as somebody who's involved in the community. A couple of things that, that have been in the news recently. Um, there is the opening of the Emma Jewell Charter Academy, a school yes. that is uh, there in that Diamond Square area. It's yes. in the old. Monroe. At what point had been the old segregated Monroe High School? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You think that's going to make a difference? I think it's going to make a tremendous difference and impact. So many people are getting behind this school. Man, this is a great school. Thomas Cole is a great guy. I'm sure you, you've heard his story or it's been in the news. He's a native, a local guy, and this is his lifelong dream to start this school in his community. And their standard of excellence, what they require, of the kids and the parents and just the work that they did in that dilapidated building is huge. It's major. And uh, actually, my granddaughter goes to that school. Is that right? <laughs> my granddaughter actually goes to that school because of the way he sold it to me, the way that they take care of it, how teachers have left different places all over the county because they believe in him to work at this school and, and how people are volunteering and in places. It's a lot, it's a lot of energy pushing towards that school, man. Well, he's got a he's got a quite a quite a job. Both he had yes. to fix up that school, which yes. had been ransacked and and stolen. But also, I mean, these are kids who are coming into class with some disadvantages. And mm -hmm. I mean, he he talked about having a niche of um, teaching the kids good nutrition, mm -hmm. something that that foundational of just mm -hmm. making good choices with what you eat and how you yes. nourish yourself. Is yes, making, no soldiers going on different. around there. That's yeah. right. Uh, what, another thing that I uh, was in the news today is a, as a gun buyback. Yes, uh, going on, police. And you know, you see these. You see a big table full of old hunting rifles. Do these make a difference? Um, I think. And 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 Eric Austin, we we laughed about this Sunday after the forum, uh, because we're going to be helping with some gun buybacks and things of that nature. I I think if nothing else, that's that's the older person who was somebody who's going to break into the house and steal their gun anyway. So I mean, at, at least nobody's breaking in to take that gun. Right. It, it's making a difference because it's, it's another gun off the streets that can't get into careless hands. Or right. so so I think I think it makes a difference. I think it I think it really makes a difference. I think it'd be interesting you know. to see a, a handgun buyback and see how many right. of those that you wind up with. Right. They may have to go up on their fee. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what's next for you? What's next for me, October 12th, okay. October 12th, is Operation Save Our Sons. Operation Save Our Sons. It's uh, birthed out of Jacksonville. Um, it's Operation Save Our Sons, and it's an initiative for young males, for black males, for young males, to, to and, and their parents to actually get empowered, to be educated, to be instructed. I mean, we are, we're partnered with, with, with uh, funeral homes, uh, Lewis Ray Mortuary with funeral homes, with, with judges, with lawyers, with, with every mentoring agency we can find to pull this thing off. And it's a day of four hours where we truly engage with these young men and talk to them about life skills, talk to them about health, talk to them about making the right decisions, talk to them about doing what they're supposed to do and being where they're supposed to be. And there's also a portion where the parents go off for classes to get the training and the things that they need because I think that's a missing gap a lot of times. Sometimes we have children raising children. And um, 
And we're just excited about it. We're really, really excited about that. That's the next move. Save Our Sons. It was birthed out of Jacksonville, a guy by the name of John Guns. And, uh, and that's actually my pastor. And uh, it's, it's just it's going to be a smooth transition. The, the juvenile uh, justice department um, are sending kids that are already um, somehow connected in the system. And they're sending those kids and we're reaching out to the schools and just really trying to get as many young boys as we can there. Travis Wash, good luck with all Thank the you. initiatives you've got going you. on. Thank you. That's great insight from Pastor Jarvis Wash on corners of Brevard that many of us never visit but should know about. Now, for something completely different, check out my newfound freedom and our ability to ride. The state has just opened the Pineda Causeway to bicycles, meaning that we're free to quit the oil companies, quit your insurance company, and get to work if you want over this bridge under your own power. But how safe is it? Well, today we're going to give it a road test and check out where the hazards really lie. All right, here we go. Right away, the day's only hazard, roadkill. People think the skeeviest part of this ride is the bridge. No, 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 no. It begins right here where the bike lanes end. All right, we're approaching the bridge now. See how hard this is. A rumble strip jars any driver or cyclist who might veer out of their lane. Most of the way, the lane is five and a half feet. I expected this uh, on-ramp area near Patrick Air Force Base at the South Gate to be pretty bad, but it wasn't bad at all. The tops of bridges are narrower, but none took more than a minute and a half to climb and descend. Watch for green textured warning paint at on and off ramps. Conclusion, this is a pretty safe ride with wide shoulders and pretty courteous drivers. It's a great recreational ride, especially if you include it as part of a loop with Tropical Trail. Or to ride over to some good fishing on the Indian River. Be free, but do be careful. Well, that's our program. Remember to publish your opinion on anything you saw on today's program. Send us a letter to letters at floridatoday.com. I'm Matt Reed. We'll see you right here next week, right here in the Florida Day Newsroom. Mm -hmm.